All right. So the part of the chapter we're going to be focusing on this morning for a sermon is right there at the very end of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. I'll reread them for you. The Bible says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition, oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And what I'll be preaching about this morning, the title of my sermon is Oppositions of Science, Falsely So-Called. There's a lot of people who oppose the truth. There's a lot of people who oppose the, God, the Bible and the God of the Bible. There's a lot of people who oppose Jesus Christ. And there's many devices that people will use to attack Christianity, to attack God, to attack the Bible. And one of those methods is to use so-called science. Now, I am a big fan of science. I love science. Science in itself, there's nothing wrong with. It's great. It's fine. I mean, how could you not like science? The, the dictionary definition of science, according to Merriam-Webster, is the state of knowing. Knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. That is science by definition. Science by definition is great. Knowledge Having wisdom, the, the state of knowing, the Bible exalts these things, right? I mean, read the book of Proverbs. It's all about knowledge. It's all about getting wisdom. This is, this is very important that God says that we have science, that we have knowledge. But in turn, if science is knowing or knowledge, we've got a very scientific book here because we have a lot of knowledge in the word of God. I mean, this is word. Jesus Christ said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. And where do you get knowledge from? You're going to get knowledge from the truth. This is a book. So, so don't tell me that you can't love science and love the Bible at the same time. The two go hand in hand. Amen. Unless you have science falsely so-called. That's not real science. Now, that first definition, I like that definition. It's a state of knowing. It's, it's knowledge. But um, most people probably have a tendency more to think of, and, and I got, there's a couple other definitions they had on there. They have a definition of science for English language learners and a definition of science for students. So it's worded a little bit different, and they, and they say, you know, it's knowledge about or study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiments and observation. This is what most people, when you hear the word science, this is what most people think in their minds, right? You're not just thinking knowledge, even though that's the first definition of the word. That's what the word means. It, it gives these other, you know, for people who are learning English, when people are using the word knowledge, or ex excuse me, science, it's talking about the knowledge about or study of, you know, the natural world, the things around you, based on facts that you learn through experimentation and observation. This is what we, we tend to use the word science as. And in the, the definition of science for students, it's uh, knowledge about the natural world that is based on facts learned through experiments and observation. I love that science. I think that's great. I always have loved it. I'm a computer scientist, for those of you that don't know. I'm a computer programmer. I've, I've had an aptitude for math and science my entire life. It, it, there's something about doing the experimentations and you have your hypothesis and you have, and you have formulas and, and, you're, and you start doing these experiments and you, when you're able to predict the outcome of the experiment that you're going to perform based off of a mathematical formula. That's pretty neat. I mean, that, to me, that's kind of exciting. Other people might think that's really boring or nerdy, but to me, I thought that was pretty cool. And, and you could test things and someone comes up with this, this new formula and say, this formula de describes... Or, or shows how something works in our world, in our environment, you know, how, how, uh, how fast an object moves, you know, physics, you got, you got moving objects and coming into contact with other objects, you know, and all these formulas will, will, will calculate exactly what's going to happen and what you can expect to happen. That's very neat. That's demonstrable. You could demonstrate that. You could, you could test those things. That's true science. That's knowledge. That is how the world works around us. And it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, a little bit of a personal testimony for myself. I didn't get saved until I was 20 years old. So I grew up pretty good kid. Not, you know, I was a worldly kid. I wasn't saved, but wasn't uh, very rebellious. Didn't, you know, did, did what I needed to do. I, I did my schoolwork. I excelled at school. It came pretty easily to me. Um, 
didn't goof around a whole lot or get into a lot of trouble. But the way that I was taught was, you know, in order to be a good student, you just accept everything that you're told. We, you know, somewhere around my generation or earlier, children stopped being taught to think critically too much. There's a little bit of critical thinking, but not a lot. And at the end of the day, the reason why I was such a good student is because I just accepted everything that I was told. Now, in some cases, if you're being told the truth, that's great. You're going to do well. But when you're not being told the truth, that's not so good. Because now you're just opened up and ready to just receive whatever you're being told and you could receive lies. And that's what happened. I, I used to think my mentality when I was 16, 17, 18, and, you know, and with the public school system, my head was puffed up already anyways. They do these testings and stuff, you know, and, um, and, and just uh, a little disclaimer, I am not bragging by any means. I think this is just an indication of how poor the public school system is. They would do these test things to try to say like what, what grade level you're at, right? Where your reading comprehension is and stuff like that. So I remember taking these tests in like sixth grade and it was saying, well, you're like a 11th grader or 12th grader. I'm like, you know, at the time I was like, oh, wow, you know, but I I'll tell you right now when I was in the sixth grade, I was a sixth grader, okay? <laughs> I was not some super genius by any means but I was able to take the tests well and whatever, right? It was not, a, not that big of a deal. And, and it's not like it was a real challenge what they were giving me either. But, I mean, I grew up in a decent home. My parents helped teach me, you know, like, like I had some things going for me. A lot of other kids that I went to school with didn't have the same environment that I had and, and it wasn't as conducive for them learning as well. But that doesn't mean that, oh, you're so excited. But here's the thing, when they start doing those testings, I start to think, wow, hey, I'm pretty smart, you know, like, and, and when you're young, that really goes, all teenagers go through a point where, like, you think you're smarter than your parents, whether, whether you're the smartest kid in the class or the dumbest kid in the class, all these teenagers go through this point in their life where you think, I know more, you know, they don't know what they're talking about, they don't know, they're old, what do they know? It's even worse when you're doing well and you got these tests saying, oh, well, you're, you know, you're this smart and you're, you know. So by the time I was in high school, you know, like I said, I received this stuff. We were taught evolution. We were taught that we came from monkeys. We were taught that we came from ultimately from rocks, that the earth was billions of years old, that it rained and rained and rained. If I go, the earth had all these volcanoes and all these real scary depictions of what the earth used to look like and there's lava flowing everywhere and there's lightning and there's rain and then at some point lightning strikes the puddle and then, hey, there's life. It just happened by chance. I mean, the conditions are all perfect. There's enough carbon and oxygen and everything else in our environment and then poof. But it was, I mean, it was just this single-celled organism, just this little little thing, right? Not complicated at all until you actually study it and realize how complicated it really is. Like, oh, just a, this single, it's just a single cell organism. And then from that, everything came. One, that thing just grew and, and transformed and mutated into other things that somehow was able to find something else to reproduce with. And then, you know, fish became around and they crawled out on the, some of them crawled out on the land and became other walking creatures and then they grew wings and they started to fly. I mean, this is what we we're taught. You're right to laugh because it's ridiculous. This is not something that we observe at all at any point. Now, now it would be if we lived in a world where you can see, you know, like where animals just changed into other animals. If we lived in some other Twilight Zone world like that, then you could call that science because you see it happening. You could, you, could make, you could reproduce these events and make it happen. But that's not science. Not in our world. Not in the world we live in. There is an attack on the Bible from people that don't want to accept the truth of the Bible and they'll do anything they can to come up with any other reason, any other excuse, excuse me, to not believe this book. 
It's an opposition. And it's an opposition of science that's falsely so-called because it's not real knowledge. It's not real truth. You're being lied to craftily. And, and look, it's very crafty and it's very cunning. It got, I got to the point to where I would say, if you don't believe evolution, you are an idiot. You're stupid. You're uneducated. You don't know anything. You don't know science. You're dumb. That was my mindset as a teenager. I was already lifted up and thought I was real smart. And look, I read this stuff. I thought I knew a lot about it because I, I, I knew what I was told. I read the textbooks that we were given. And I mean, it's in a textbook, right? That means it's a fact. It's there. Someone wrote it down. I don't know who wrote it down, but there it is. I mean, my teacher gave it to me and it's right here and, and everybody's learning it, so it must be true. This is the mindset that we have. When you think critically, though, when you really think critically, you get challenge everything. Wh who, what does it really mean that this person has letters after his name? I mean, okay, he spent some time in another institution learning from other books, and from other people that said that this is the way things are. But what makes that right? Now, look, I'm not against reading and learning from books, okay? So don't, don't think that I'm a big book burner and I want you to go home and, and trash all your textbooks and don't read anything. There's knowledge out there. But we need to examine things critically to determine whether or not what we're reading and what we're receiving is true. You can't just, just well, it's been accepted, so it's true. Well, especially when it comes to things like science, which the people who want to deny the Bible say, oh, we got science, as if science is just like the be-all, end-all of everything. Look at the history of science throughout mankind's history of what was determined, deemed to be at this time, this is good science. And if you're going to stand on science, then we're going to stand on, as it, you know, even just a couple hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago in George Washington's day, the science of that time, the medical science of that time was bloodletting. When you have a fever, just to get rid of some blood. I mean, it's just this one example of something that, that now you'd, you'd be nuts, you're a kook, you know, you could probably get arrested for performing that type of a treatment on someone because it's no good. It's invalid. It doesn't work. But they, at the time, that's what they thought. That's where their science had led them. And that wasn't even that long ago. I mean, there's discoveries going on all the time. There's new experiments being done. When, when my eyes really got open to this, it was after I was saved and I was going to college and I took a social psychology class. Now, to call that, first of all, to call that science is, is a huge stretch anyways. But I, I could not believe, I actually was kind of interested, I took this, the Psych 101 class, which is kind of interesting, where they go into the, the different receptors in your eyes and, and, and go into some optical illusions and go into some other things that, that have science to it, right? It's, it's interesting. There's, there's, certain, there's certain aspects of our mind and our brain, the way our brain works, that has some science to it, real science that you, you learn some things about. And it's, and it's curious. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'll, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm kind of feeling out things. What do I want to learn? So I'll take another psychology class. So I'll take social psychology. What a bunch of rubbish. I mean, what a bunch of garbage that, that, that class was. And it's, what we do is we get the textbook and, and we started learning. Well, you know, 50 years ago or 60 years ago, this experiment was done and this is how they thought people behaved. But then this person came along and performed this experiment, which nullified that experiment. And then they thought this is the way things were. And then another experiment came along, until we got to the point where we're at today. And it's like, Okay, so when's the next person going to come out with their new study that's going to disprove what we believe right now? I mean, this, the ground is shaky. It's like sand. I mean, you've got nothing solid to say this is the way it is. And I'm not going to go into all the different reasons because, it, you know, more often than not, people have an agenda that they just want to prove. They use so-called science to prove what they already believe. They have an agenda already in their mind of what they want to say, and 
they'll come up with that conclusion. And given in these various time periods, you could even see some of the reasoning, you know, with the way the culture was, why they wanted to prove certain things. But you don't take, you know, people think they get so smart and they can't even figure out all the variables involved, especially with so social psychology, it's how humans interact with each other. There's a lot of variables involved with that. I mean, to, to think that you're smart enough to eliminate all of the various aspects that might be going on into why people do things the way they do. I mean, there's like a lifetime of experience involved in you making decisions in your life. There's ideals. There's, I mean, there's so many things involved. To think that you are so smart that you can just handle every single one of those variables to get this down to a science, you, you, you're puffed up. This is, this, this is the stuff that's used, though, as a stumbling block. They call it science. Because a lot of people are intimidated, intimidated by science. A lot of people don't spend their time researching this stuff or thinking about it. And you hear about various things, and you just assume, well, they know what they're talking about. And people accept things readily that way. That's how I accepted it. Well, these people study this, and they do this all the time, so they must know. Now, that may or may not be true. It may or may not be true. You could learn a lot of things and you could spend your entire life dedicated to studying something, but it doesn't make you right. You could learn various things, but we're, what we're going to see here in a little bit is how, how much science today is, has foundations that, that are false. And here's the thing. When, when, you're, when you start from a foundation, if, you, if you're going to build a house and you lay the foundation and your foundation's cracked, and it's unstable, what good is that house going to be at all? You could be using really good lumber. You could be using the best materials of every other aspect of the house. But if the foundation is not stable, everything else is going to be destroyed. It's going to become tumbling down. And that's where we get to the science. So there's some aspects of the science where there's real science, but it's based on a faulty premise. So you can do these experiments and you say, yes, we got from point A to point B and, and, and we have these formulas and, and these experiments to prove it. But you started off on a lie. Right. And, and that puts you in the wrong direction from the very beginning. Now, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the age of the earth. <coughs> the age of the earth, not earths, earth. Science falsely so-called needs the earth to be extremely old. And when I say, you know, science falls to the cause, people believe in evolution. People believe in the Big Bang. They need the earth to be extremely old to get you to put your faith in something that is ultimately not scientific. Because they figure by adding years and years and years and years to something, it becomes more plausible, right? So the whole concept of creatures turning into other animals. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, you know, the single-celled organism turn, turning into other things and coming out. They try to make it more plausible by saying, yeah, yeah, but well, well, it's not like it happened overnight. You know, I mean, this took millions of years and billions of years. Numbers that the human mind has a problem even grasping how much that is to begin with. I mean, you talk about a hundred million years. A hundred million years. Well, what is that? How do you even wrap your mind around 100 million years? So I don't know. Things change. When does a creature ever turn into another animal? And, and see, they, 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 they add this mystery to it. It's this mystical element of time to get you to say, oh, well, yeah, after so much time. Because what they do is they take the observable, how you have certain animals that adapt, right? And we, even as human beings, adapt to your surrounding, right? You, you adapt, your, 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 your skin adapts, your features can adapt, you know, your eyes can adapt to things. You, you know, if you, if, you, if you grew up in a world and, and it was dark like all the time, your eyes would, would end up slowly adapting to that darkness. But you're not going to turn into a bat. <laughs> okay? I mean, there's, there's a limit to this stuff. But when, what, what they do is they say, well, see, you change a little bit here, you change a little bit there. And all of these little changes add up, and, and over a long enough time, the end result is not recognizable from where you started off with. And that's the big leap right there. 
because that's not observed. We observe the small changes, and, that's, and that is science. But when you get to these, these big events, it's, um, it's just not there. Now, for me, as I mentioned before, I, I was adamant, staunch, evolution, Big Bang supporter. So when I got saved, literally, like within days of, of, of putting my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, I knew I had a problem on my hands because, and it wasn't, now, and let me explain the problem too, because when I got saved, my problem wasn't, is the Bible right? When I put my faith in Jesus, Jesus is the word. I already decided and knew, you know, the Bible's right. I mean, that's where my salvation, that's where my soul was resting on to be saved and go to heaven. I knew that that was right. But what about then all of this stuff that I learned? What, how does that fit in? How does that work? I talked to my brother about it for a little while and, and he was, he had all, he's a little bit further along the path than I was and he gave me some, some other resources to read into. And, and very good resources. I don't remember exactly. One of the things I read, I remember it's called Bone of Contention. And that talked about the fossil record. It talked a little bit about how they make the, uh, the extrapolate entire creatures off of bone fragments and come up with what they think creatures looked like off of very, very little, which you're not told about in the textbooks, by the way. Anything that's going to cause you doubt and be like, wait a minute, how, like, how in the world do you come up with that? And with the, the lies of the, you know, the Cro-Magnon man, and they show you all these Neanderthal men and stuff, and it's like, do you know what they build these people off of? Do you know how small the fragments are that they find? And they just say, this is what it was? They don't find these full skeletons. Those are artist renditions. Those are people with imaginations telling you, well, th based off of this fragment, this is what we think it looked like at the end of the day. You know, someone's going to say, no, there's a, there's a scientific way to do that. Look, I've looked into it. I've read about it. Personally, you, you read it for yourself and, this, and come up with your own conclusion. I believe that the Bible is true. Amen. But they'll, they'll, um, they'll come up with, with various methods to, to try to show you that, no, see, look, we came from animals. We came from apes. And... Um, that was just one thing, I, you know, and there's other things I looked at. And understanding the scientific method and being all into that, you know, I was looking for the more technical arguments to show why what I had learned was not true. And one of the big things for me is when I learned more about the radiometric dating. And uh, more, more familiar known as like carbon-14 dating, if you've heard that, that term before. Carbon-14 is, carbon is probably what most people have heard of, but it's not the only method that's used. They use argon, argon dating, and basically these are elements. So to break it down real simply, our atmosphere, carbon isn't just about everything. And there's, there's carbon in the atmosphere, and the carbon gets transferred to plants through photosynthesis. They, they receive some of the, the, the carbon that's in the atmosphere, and when the animals eat the plants, so biological creatures, they eat the plants, they absorb that carbon that was in the atmosphere. So basically what they have in their body, the amount of carbon-14 that they have in a specific isotope, okay, these are radioactive isotopes is what they are. This is radiation attached, you know, to carbon. The, the, the element is, you know, the, the, the proper chemical way of saying it is C14, carbon-14, that comes into the body of, of an organic organism it's supposed to reflect what's in the atmosphere at the given time. Once that creature dies, they stop consuming the carbon. The carbon starts to decay. There's known half-lives of these elements. Um, and they say, you know, with carbon, it's like 5,000-something years. I don't know the number offhand. But it's, you know, there's a certain amount of years. And they say, well, the, the, based on how much was there at the beginning, and how much has decayed, we could determine how many years have passed since this animal died. In a nutshell, that's the way the science is supposed to work. The problem is that the entire formula is based on assumptions. For example, the assumption that the rate of decay is a constant. 
is one of the assumptions. Now, when they first came up with this method in like the 1940s, they thought it was a constant. Since then, it's been proven that no, actually, there have been changes in the atmosphere that have affected the amount of carbon up and down. The carbon-14. So that you can't assume it's just a constant. But what they did to, to handle that is they say, well, we've been taking these measurements of the atmosphere since like the late 1800s, so we know how much carbon's been there. And they, they adjust their dating for that, but they didn't go back and have these measurements going back for hundreds or thousands of years. So you have no idea going any back further than what's this short time frame. But what they'll say is, oh, but we know why they changed. We know why. Because there's been this increase in burning fossil fuels, which impacts the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, is one, is one of the, the main reasons. And then, what was the other one? I forget what the other one was. It doesn't matter, right? There, there are two recent events in history that, that they're saying is, is, well, we know that these things happened that impacted the, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere. How do you know that other events haven't happened throughout history that would affect the same thing? How do you know that, you know, there haven't been a, a whole bunch more volcanic eruptions in history as, you know, in, in outlying areas that aren't even, even very populated for people to write down that these historical events happen? You, know, you don't know. And when you're going to start saying that the Earth is, is way, you know, we think the Earth is about six, you know, a little over 6,000 years old. We don't, no, I don't, we don't think that. We know that. Because God told us it. Because it's written in the Bible and you could, you could actually figure out how old the earth is. Amen. But they're saying it's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions, billions of years old. And you're dealing with that type of time frame. They want you to believe that animals are becoming something else, but, oh, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, is, oh, that's remained the same. While everything else is changing and turning into other animals over hundreds of millions of years, that stayed constant. It's nonsense. That is not critical thinking at all. That's just, we don't know what else to do, so we're going to use this formula. And it's coming up with these big numbers that we, that we want to get because we need to make sure that this Earth is really old. Now, there's many of other radioactive uh, dating techniques, and I would just throw this out there because the carbon-14 is, is supposed to test biological material. It's the whole point. There's the things that, that are living and die, plants, animals. But if you were to test, let's say, a rock, right? Rocks, the earth, for age. Who knows, even if you have a very, very accurate method of dating, if it existed, I don't believe it exists, if you have a method that exists, When God created the world, how do you know the starting point of everything on this earth? I mean, he created a mature earth. When he created Adam and Eve, he didn't create an egg, you know, in a, he didn't create an embryo. He didn't create an infant. He didn't create a teenager. He created an adult, male and female. They were already mature. So on day one, they already would have the appearance of an adult, even though they're one day old. So when you're looking at things like the ground or the rocks, how old do they look versus how old are they actually? When did they come into existence? Well, they came into existence already having certain properties that God determined he wanted to have that might not fit your scientific model of how much of a certain element everything should have at creation. Radiometric dating has many pitfalls. Radiation from the sun, for example, impacts the rate at which these elements or isotopes decay. Because a radioactive, I mean, the radiation comes from the sun, by and large. There's a majority of radiation comes from the sun to the earth. So when you have sunspots, sun flares, things like that, there's going to be more radiation hitting our atmosphere. How do you know in the past that there hasn't been more activity in the sun to cause more, either more presence of radiation, less presence of radiation, more decay? I mean, you don't know these things. Yet, they'll tell you till they're blue in the face that, no, no, trust us, we're smart, 
You can believe what I'm saying. We've done experiments. We're scientists, so just believe it. You know, to most people, when you see a periodic table of elements, your eyes might start to glass over. Even when I'm talking this morning, you're like, oh, come on, Pastor Burson. Like, this is so boring. I don't care about the radioactive isotopes. That's like the probably the most common response to this type of talk. Because only certain people are even interested in this stuff to begin with. And unfortunately for you, I'm one of these people. Okay, so you're getting, you're getting a little bit heavier dose this morning than maybe you'd asked for. Okay, but I do like this stuff. And, I get, and, and the, the big problem though is that some of it makes sense. Some of it does. Like, like you could follow their logic, you could follow their reason, you could follow their formulas. But going all the way back to the start, you're built on premises and assumptions that are unprovable, Amen. which makes the whole rest of that process suspect. You cannot rely on that as being fact. And see, most people also, but they'll, they'll, we have a tendency to believe whatever the person says about their studies because they don't know anything about it. So when a person sounds like an expert and they could throw off a lot of big words, and in science there's lots of big words, they can make you think, well, I'm really stupid and this person's really smart. And they could rattle off some things and they just say, well, they must know what they're talking about and you, just, and you have a tendency to believe them. They may or may not know what they're talking about. But you, you know, and at that point, it's faith. You're trusting that they know what they're talking about. Why would you, let me ask you this, why would you trust someone who calls himself a scientist? They went to school, they went to college, right? They perform experiments, but you don't know anything about that. Personally, if you don't know, you haven't seen the experimentation. You actually haven't done enough real research to see what are they basing this off of. You're trusting what they did. Now, there's a lot of good science out there that I've, that I've come to learn and trust, but I haven't reproduced them myself. I'm just believing that when they said they performed this experiment and these are the results, that that's actually what happened. Has anyone here done like all these very, well, we would do some, and this is why I love science because in some cases we have, you know, the, I remember in, in high school we learned the Doppler effect and we would time it and record it and do the sound. And Doppler effect is when, you know, when, when you have a sound and it's going by you at a certain rate of speed, it goes, right, and, and it goes away. So we would measure these things and test them. Those are things that we actually did firsthand testing what we're learning in the textbook. Good, you're reproducing that. You are confirming that what you're being told is true. Has anybody here confirmed the radioactive decay for carbon dating to see that, d did they conduct it? You know, I mean, you could, you could read about it. All I'm saying is that at some level, you have to have some faith to accept that what you're being told is true. Yet, scientists or people who believe in science falsely so-called will rip you up one side and down another for having faith in the Bible. Faith in a book that's based on knowledge and wisdom. This gets really interesting. I'm going to give you some history here. One of the biggest fundamental problems with just about every dating technique is this philosophy, and I, and I was already talking about before, it's called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism, you think of uniform. If you're wearing a uniform, everyone's dressed the same, right? Uniformitarianism is when it's this belief or this concept that the way things are now is the way that they've always been. So whatever we observe now, we could just apply the same math, the same formulas to say, this is the way things have always been. And this is a major, major pitfall. I'm going to read for you about this subject of uniformitarianism from a couple different sources. The first one is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay? If you're looking for respected sources, people trust the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Rightfully so or not, doesn't matter. I mean, this is something that, that people go to. And, I, and I'm not saying they're just a bunch of liars. Okay, I'm not 
I'm not claiming that, but this is just some information that's out there about this subject, uniformitarianism. In geology, the do, and the, listen to this word, the doctrine suggesting that Earth's geologic processes acted in the same manner and with essentially the same intensity in the past as they do in the present, and that such uniformity is sufficient to account for all geologic change. They called it a doctrine. But it's not a religion, it's science. The doctrine suggesting, and, and this is what it suggests. Did they say it's a fact? Nope. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. It says, I'll keep reading here. When William Wewell, a University of Cambridge scholar, introduced the term in 1832, the prevailing view, so the, the view all the way up to that point, the common view held by people and by scientists and by everybody, was called catastrophism was that the earth had originated through supernatural means and had been affected by a series of catastrophic events such as the biblical flood. Imagine that. People actually believed the Bible to be true. And that's what science was based on. Now we got this guy, William, William Wewell, saying that, no, this isn't true in that actually the way things are now is the way they've always been. There is no flood. And this is why it's so important. You know, this uniformitarianism in geology, geology is so important. Geology is one of the backbones of, of their dating and trying to tell us how old the earth is to begin with. And when you discount a catastrophic event like a worldwide flood, you are throwing, I mean, you, you are discounting so much. We, there's so much evidence for it to begin with. Everything we see in the natural world here, for example, we just went out yes, uh, over on this camping trip. We went, we went out to uh, Payson, near Payson. And one of the things that we saw when we're out there, we're on our way to camping trip. There's a sign that said paleo site. So like, cool. So on the way out, we decided to hit it up. Paleo site, there's a whole bunch of fossils and imprints on the rocks. There's a bunch of limestone in there. So we go, and, and me and my girls, and they found all kinds of cool stuff there. We're over 5,000 feet elevation on top of a mountain. We've got a seashell in my hand that we grab from the top of the mountain. We've got another one. looks kind of like a clam. You guys can see these after the service. My daughter's found these. We've got other, other fossilized and imprints. Here's another one that you can't really see it from where you're sitting, but, but it's an it's outline of a shell on a rock formed from into the limestone on top of a mountain. Now, what the science policy so-called is going to tell you, uniformitarianism, and this is why they need a lot of time, is that, well, the way things happen now is the way they've always been. How, how quick are mountains sprouting up in what we could observe today? <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyone, anyone got a stopwatch? timing how fast the mountains are, are popping up in this world and how much erosion is there a lot more erosion than the way that, that the bottoms are. but let's say okay you have tectonic shift you have these plates right and they'll say plates come together and then they go and then and then you get these mountains coming up but it's still not happening so what what they'll claim is that oh well this was all this was underwater and then the mountain was formed that's why you have marine life fossils on top of mountains Right? But think about that. That means that, I mean, how, how long are they saying that actually took place? I mean, it couldn't be a catastrophe because that would be catastrophism. You, then, now, now all of a sudden you're going to start mixing your, your foundation of geology. But see, they'll throw things in there when it's convenient for them to make explanations for stuff. Oh, well, that happened. I thought you said everything happened uniformly. Because if it happens slowly, if, these, if, these, if they're slowly, you know, the plates are shifting and they're kind of building up because of that pressure and the land, if that's taken millions of years, the, the shells that were on top there are going to be washing down as the mountain is building up. I mean, it's, it's natural. You're going to have the rain coming. It's going to be, they're not going to be at the tops, at the pinnacle. But when you have a worldwide flood, a catastrophe where everything's underwater and, and you've got stuff moving around all over the place, 
It's going to settle where it settles when, when the waters go back down and the flood's gone. And it's going to be where it is. And if it's on top of a mountain, then it's on top of a mountain. And these are just, I mean, these are just small examples of little shells. They found like, like whale, like entire whale um, fossils on tops of mountains in, in certain areas. I mean, it totally supports the biblical account of a flood. And trying to explain this other ways than the science falsely so-called is, is a huge, huge, huge stretch. And that requires a lot of faith. And look, I'll say either way requires faith. Right. I'm not saying that you don't have to have faith in the Bible. But what I am saying is that the, the account that the Bible gives, you, it, there's, no, there's no discounting that with any real science. There's nothing contradicting what the Bible says with real science, with people who don't have an agenda that are trying to disprove the Bible because they don't like God. So it says here, I'm going to keep reading here, in contrast to catastrophism, uniformitarianism postulates that phenomena displayed in rocks may be entirely accounted for by geologic processes that continue to operate. In other words, the present is the key to the past. Everything the way it is today is the way it was before. From, a, from another website, it's called physicalgeography.net. This is a, a man who's a professor, I believe in Canada. He's got, you know, PhD. He's got all, you know, I checked him out to see if, you know, this website is anything that could be considered reputable. You know, I don't like just picking stuff out from people who, like, who's that guy? He, he put a book up, his own book up online for free. So this is where this comes from. It's, uh, it's physicalgeography.net. Uniformitarianism is one of the most important unifying comps, concepts in the geosciences. This is foundational for that science. The term uniformitarianism was first used in 1832 by William Wewell, we already read this, a University of Cambridge scholar, look at this, to present an alternative explanation for the origin of the earth. That was the whole point. The reason why he said is, a, well, I need to present an alternative explanation from what people are believing now because they're believing the Bible. The point was to present an alternative. The prevailing view at that time was that the earth was created through supernatural means and had been affected by a series of catastrophic events such as the biblical flood. This theory is called catastrophism. The theory of uniformitarianism was also important in shaping the development of ideas in other disciplines. So this, the, the reason why I'm covering, spending so much time on this is because it's, it, it's impacted so many other areas of science. This one concept is foundational to modern science that people are going to turn to to deny God's word. The work of Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace on the origin of the Earth's species extended the ideas of uniformitarianism into the biological sciences. So they took this concept and said, great, we're going to run with this, and now we're going to make this explanation work for biology as well. Living, living organisms. The theory of evolution is based on the principle that the diversity seen in the Earth's species can be explained by the uniform modification of genetic traits over long periods of time. That's what I was just saying. We adapt, we get a few modifications here, there, until before you know it, it's just something else completely over time. Thus, uniformitarianism suggests that the continuing uniformity of existing processes should be used as the framework for understanding the geomorphic and geologic history of the Earth. Today, most theories of landscape evolution use the concept of unif uniformitarianism to describe how the various landforms of the Earth came to be. Let's just ignore the fact that like every culture in history pretty much has an account of a worldwide flood. Let's just ignore that that happened. Even people who weren't followers of Jehovah in other regions of the world that had their own false gods, that had their own beliefs. Let's just ignore all of this human written history accounts that, wow, everybody has an account that the world at some point was underwater. Let's just ignore that. And let's just assume that everything happened this way, you know, over a long period of time. Let's ignore that there's no way that the Colorado River, the way that's flowing right now, could have possibly carved out the Grand Canyon. Let's just ignore that. Let's just tell people that it just, it just happened. The evidence is all around us. 
Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll get into more Bible now. I know, I, sp I, might, I might have to turn this into a two-party. I'm not sure. I'm going to try to get through the rest of this material quickly. I know we've been here for a while. It's just, it's an important subject because th there, are, there are Christians and non-Christians alike that are deceived by so-called scientists. And I at least want to challenge you to think more critically about what you've been told and what you've been taught to go and look at this stuff a little bit more carefully and not just accept because someone calls himself a scientist to believe it. Second Peter chapter 3, the Bible predicted uniformitarianism thought or philosophy. Second Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the, fa look at this. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's exactly uniformity. Hey, wh where is it? Oh, I thought Jesus was coming back, huh? They mocked the Bible. When's Jesus coming back, huh? I thought your Bible was true. Nope, from the beginning all the way back to when everything was created. And they believe in a big bang, which is, I'll get into that in a minute. From the beginning of the creation, everything just continues the way it has been. This is what the, what the ungodly people were saying at the at last days. The Bible already predicted this. Verse number five. For this, they willingly are ignorant of. These people... They're not just deceived. They're willingly ignorant because they don't want to believe in a God. They don't want to believe that there's a creator. They don't want to believe that they're accountable to somebody else, that there actually is a God. There actually is a creator. They're willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Look at this. You, I mean, this is mind blowing whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved on the fire against the day of judgment, perdition of ungodly men. It's, it's, the Bible specifically brings up the flood. He's saying they're willingly ignorant. You know, the people that are saying things have always been the same as they have been since the beginning of the creation are the same ones that are mocking God, they're mocking the Bible, and they're saying that, nope, everything's exactly the same, and they're willingly ignorant to not acknowledge that there was a global flood. That's what the Bible says. How long ago was this written down? A couple thousand years? But William Wewell, in the 1800s, came up with this brand new idea. Hey, guess what? I think things have always been this way and that we can model everything off of this. Huh. God knew you were going to come up with that. They're willingly ignorant. But, you know, to some people, just be like, oh, it's a coincidence. Uh -huh. Brand new, scientific, in the, end, in, in the last days. Sure. From, from that same site I was just quoting from earlier, in... in I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just, I have to laugh if you actually think that there's, there's any, w after I read this statement about the Big Bang, you want to call this science? It's laughable. So try to contain yourselves when I read this statement because anyone who actually knows the truth, this is a joke. About 11 to 15 billion years ago, all of the matter and energy in the universe in the universe, I mean, look up to the sky and you see all the stars, all the energy from all the stars, from the sun, from everything in the whole world, the energy and the matter. I mean, the matter, like, think about how big this earth is, this one planet, all that matter. All the matter and energy in the universe was concentrated into an area the size of an atom. An atom. You can't see an atom with your eye. Oh, it, it just was. Because, 
because it was, because it had to come from somewhere. <laughs> All the matter, energy in the whole universe, size of an atom, at this moment, matter, energy, space, and time, did, well, wait a minute, at this moment, matter, energy, space, and time did not exist. I thought all that matter and energy was, was contained in an, in an atom, but now you're saying it didn't exist? What? Then suddenly the universe began to expand at an incredible rate. Wait a minute, I thought everything happens at the same way that it always has. And matter, energy, space, and time came into being. And time just came into being. Didn't exist before, but now it exists. Why? I, I don't know, it just did. I mean, we have time now, so it must have, right? Because it was all part of this atom that exploded. Hmm. Good science there, yeah. Yeah, you're real scientific. I mean, you, you've got me convinced, man. That makes a lot of sense. That makes way more sense than there's actually a creator that, that made everything. That makes a lot of sense. It was, just, it was just in an atom that exploded into everything that we see here today real smart you see people and this and this goes to Romans chapter 1 this type of thinking can only come from somebody who's a Romans 1 type of person Romans 1 21 says that because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools you know what? You're going to tell me that all the energy and matter of the whole universe, time, space, everything was wrapped up in the size of an atom? You're a fool. You're a fool. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. You are a fool. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The fool that, that thinks they're so smart and brilliant comes up with this nonsense. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The real reason why this nonsense is even taught and passed off as science is because the people promoting it don't like the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. It's not necessarily that they don't want to believe in a God, it's that they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't like him. And this is the, I don't know if I've mentioned this in a sermon or not, but just about a week or so ago, I was speaking with a 19-year-old man out soul winning. And, and his big thing was, you know, at first he said he was an atheist, but then he said, well, it's not that I don't believe that, you know, the possibility of there being a God. And, and I basically said, I was like, you just don't like the God of the Bible, do you? No. Because he was judging the morality of the Bible for himself. He was saying, I don't like this. And the big thing with him, which isn't surprising because today's youth is so brainwashed and backwards, it's a sodomy. It's a homosexuality. That they just want to think, that what's wrong with that? Why would God have the death penalty on it? Why is that such a big deal? It is a big deal. Amen. It's perverted. It's disgusting. It's not normal. It's not natural. But when you start to, you know, who are you to judge God? You're his creation. You're going to tell God that you're not right for, for having this type of justice? When you're puffed up, who is God to you? Right. Make up your own God. Right. And that's what he did. For no other reason, but he didn't like it. Not because of facts. Because you know, when I started talking to him, I'm thinking, okay, great, this is a good opportunity. I'm actually a pretty good person to talk to people who might have a, some type of a scientific base, you know, a so-called scientific based reasoning to not want to accept what the Bible says. I'll talk to those people because I understand this stuff. And I could bring you facts and we could go over it and I could discuss the, the science with you and I could show you the holes in their ways of thinking. If that's where the conversation is, if that's the stumbling block, if that's the hang-up, I'm thinking, great, I can help this person out. But what it turned out to be was it wasn't that at all. It's just that I don't like this God. And to be honest, that's the problem with just about everybody. It has nothing to do with the science. The science is an excuse. 
It's something to, to say, oh, this is the reason. Because you don't want to just say what's in your heart that I don't like God. There is no sincere interest in finding out the truth from these people that believe in evolution. It's impossible to say that you believe the Bible and evolution. And actually, I mean, I mean there's no way that the two line up. You cannot believe with, with, in both. Do you believe Genesis 1 as a Bible believer? If, you, if you're a Bible believer this morning, do you believe Genesis chapter 1? Because I do. Do you believe it means what it says? If you do, if you believe that God's not lying to you in the order that he created everything, then you can't believe evolution. The two don't match up. You know why? Because on day one, God created light and darkness, day and night. On day two, he created the firmament or the heaven. Okay? We have light and darkness and then the heaven. And then on three, you have the dry land appears from the waters. Okay, so now you have seas and the earth and grass, herbs, and trees. Vegetation. That's day three. Day four, you have the sun, moon, and stars. Sun, moon, and stars after plants, vegetation, the seas. Is that what evolution teaches? That the sun came later? Day five, sea creatures and birds on the same day. Is that what evolution teaches? That you had birds and sea creatures both happening concurrently at the same time prior to the land animals? Because day six is the land animals and the insects and man being created. It doesn't match up with evolution at all. Even if you want to say, oh, well, those days, you know, they're really longer periods of time because you want to try to fit in man's wisdom and this junk science into the Bible and try to make the Bible fit junk science. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter how many millions of years you say a day is, you still got the same order of events unless you're going to call God a liar. Not to mention that that's, a gra that's, that's grasping at straws anyways to say that, oh, when you said a day, it's not really a day because a day is to the Lord like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. That's what people like to throw that around. First of all, it says a thousand years. It doesn't say a million or billion years. Second of all, in this context, the Bible says very clearly in Genesis 1 and throughout the whole, every day of creation God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Oh, but somehow that's a thousand or a million or billion years. The evening and the morning, he's telling you explicitly, look, the sun was up and the sun, you know, the sun went down, the sun came up. That's a day. That's a day that we understand it today. How could you interpret that to be anything other than a day unless you're trying to, to make the Bible say something it doesn't? And even in Exodus chapter 20, it explains why the, the commandment was given to remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. But those are really just period, great periods of time. What? No. In six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth. That's what it says. It's what he did. It's the only thing that even makes sense given the account. You have to accept God's word by faith. I mean, there's, there's lots of reasonable evidence around us that support the Bible. There's plenty of evidence that support a worldwide flood, that the accounts of the Bible are actually true. But ultimately, you have to accept it by faith. But you know what? Don't come to me and tell me that the Big Bang is science, which is different than accepting what the Bible says by faith. Because you have to accept that nonsense by faith. Right. There's no way you can prove that. None. No scientist is able to prove the origins of the earth. They can't even prove how old things are. You can't do it without assumptions and without just making things up. That's what an assumption is. You're making something up. 
She said, I just think, I think this is the way it was because this is the way it is now. You don't know that. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of science. Remember, science is knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of science. Beware of science falsely so-called. So many people want to cling to science as their authority and don't even realize that they've been deceived. They're deceived by people who don't like God and want to come up with any other explanation than God. And ultimately, it's a spiritual matter. Many people simply have too much pride. They like thinking that they're so smart. Us poor, stupid Christians, you know, we're, we're just ignorant and we just have this need to make up a God in order to make us feel better about where we came from. That's what, that's what the argument is. They'll tell you, we're just dumb. We're, we're, we're ignorant. We're stupid. Don't know anything. You just, the, reason why, the reason why you don't believe the science is because you just don't understand it. Okay. No, the reason why I don't believe it is because I do understand it. I, I actually do understand it. I've done my own studying on it enough, enough to, am I an expert in the area? No. I don't need to be. When you, when you realize something's false, why do I need to go further in studying the, you know, I, I don't need to study every single aspect of Mormonism to know that it's false. Once I found out it's false, I mean, good enough. I don't need to study every false way to be an expert in it to tell you that it's false. As soon as you find out, oh, wow, they're actually not, not consistent here. They're actually not, uh, they don't have any integrity with the way that they, they view their own science and are going to stand on things that you can't say as a fact. But teach it with the authority that it is a fact. Sorry, as soon as, as, soon as, as, soon as you start telling me that everything exploded out of nothing, there's really not much more that you can teach me. Amen. If that's your science, good luck. Because I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to listen to you. That's absurd. That is absurd. There's no level of understanding you need to reach in order to understand that everything came from nothing without God. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful creation that you've made, dear Lord. There are so many other things that we go on and on about with this subject, dear Lord, such as all the, the, the perfection within your creation and the complication. When you actually study biology, when you actually study plants and animals and the way that everything works together so perfectly and, and complements each other and can't survive without each other, to think that everything happened by chance and that everything came from nothing by chance is, is, is foolish. God, I pray that you would please help us to reach the foolish. Lord, help us to, to shine that glorious light of the gospel and, and the truth and the wisdom and knowledge from the Bible, dear Lord, to help instruct those that oppose themselves, dear Lord. Help us to be meek and humble and to, and to be able to, to show uh, people the errors of their ways. I pray that you would please not allow, help us, help us in this room, help all of us believers, dear Lord, to, um, to not be deceived by these oppositions of science that are falsely so-called, that no one would have their faith shaken because, because someone who believes that everything exploded from nothing is telling them something, Lord, and, and trying, to, trying to shake their, their faith in the Bible. Lord, we know, we know that your word is true. We're trusting in it with our souls. God, we ask and pray for your guidance in our lives and that you would continue to open up wisdom and knowledge unto us, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.